200 years ago, a lady walked down this stretch of beach that we are at today looking for fossils. What she was to find here would revolutionise all of the sciences. It would open up a brand new branch of study, opening up to the new world of paleontology. She was revered and respected by experts all around the globe. Her name? Mary Anning and she lived in the little village of Lyme Regis just behind me here. Now we have come here today to Charmouth and Lyme Regis to actually explore the reality of the rocks. Is it exactly how we learn in books and in schools or is there a hidden truth? I'm Indiana Joe, welcome to the Rocks Cry Out. Let's go and explore and find some sea dragons. So what geology do we have here? Well, it's a very famous sequence that goes all around the world. What you have is down here, we have our hard limestone, full of fossils. You can see we've got a little bivalve shell just in here, full of fossils the whole way through. And this layer runs the whole way along, as you just saw. The next bit above, you have this stuff, the clay, the shale, again, full of fossils. Very, very rich, very, very clay-like. Then you have another layer of the limestone on top of that. Then you have a layer of shale. Then you have another layer. In fact, it's all layers. In fact, this is called lias. And what does lias mean? Well, it's simply Cornish for layers. It really is. You see, when the first scientists began going and studying this, and they studied the same rock sequence down in Cornwall, when they asked them what it was in their Cornish accent, they said layers and layers and layers, which became the lias. It's really fun to learn how these words sometimes come about. Now these rocks are labelled as Jurassic. And what does Jurassic mean? Because when most people think of the word, they think of a particular movie full of dinosaurs that was supposedly 65 million years in the making, as the phrase goes. Okay, where does the name come from? Well, it was named by Alexander von Humboldt, who with a name like that, you could probably guess came from Germany. And he was the king's geographer. He got the privilege and the opportunity to travel all over the world, looking at geography, looking at the rocks. And when he came here to England, he looked at the lias. When he went to America, he looked at the lias. When he went to Canada, he looked at the lias and he recognized it because you see, he lived in the Jura Mountains back in Germany and the Jura Mountains are also full of the lias. So as he travelled around, he recognised all these rocks. They were exactly like the ones in the Jura Mountains. So he named them Jurassic, the rocks like the ones in the Jura Mountains. Nothing to do with millions of years, nothing to do with evolution, but everything to do with where you recognise these rocks from. Now, these rocks at the bottom are supposed to be 190 million years old. At the top, they're supposed to be 185. Now, I do not believe in those dates and we'll find out why later, but for now, let's go digging. Let's go find some fossils. Let's go if we can discover some sea dragons. Now, one of the things that Mary Anning is most famous for is her discovery of sea dragons. And they're found all the way up and down this coast. And we've got some examples here. Now this was not found exactly from here at Lyme Regis and Charmouth, but is dredged off of the coast. This kind of stuff can be washed up all the time. This is a big plesiosaur paddle bone, uh, part of its fins that it would have used to swim through. However, these are the most common sea dragons that you find here. Can you see all of these? These are vertebrae from uh, ichthyosaur. They are found all throughout here. You can even come and find your own examples. They're not that rare. Okay, why do I keep calling them sea dragons? Well, what's really interesting is if you go to the Natural History Museum, the one set up by Richard Owen, uh, he had all these dinosaurs labelled, these big swimming marine reptiles labelled as sea dragons. You can still see the original label there. Okay, what's the significance of this? Well, you see Sir Richard Owen collected dinosaurs and he also bought dinosaurs off of collectors. In fact, out of all of the dinosaurs that Mary Anning found down here, most of them ended up being sold to Richard Owen and going on display in the Natural History Museum in London. Now, what's really interesting is that in 1841, Sir Richard Owen coined the name Dinosaur. Now, according to him, this was the technical name. It was like, you know, the Latin name of the time. It was their technical posh scientific name that should be used for the general group. 
What did he call dinosaurs before he came up with the name? And what did he continue calling dinosaurs after he came up with the name? What was their common name, if you like? Well, what's interesting is Sir Richard Owen, before, during and after he made up the term dinosaur, called them dragons. In fact, so did many other people. Mary Annan called them dragons. All of the scientists who worked down here called them dragons, who worked on the Isle of Wight digging up dinosaurs. They were all known as dragons, sea dragons or land dragons. And this continued until fairly recently when it became politically incorrect to call them dragons. Because you see, dragons today are supposed to be stuff of myth and legend. But there are many people who still call them dragons, the Chinese being included. The word long in the Chinese language, the word that they use for dragon, is exactly the same word they use when they're talking about what we today call dinosaurs. They're one and the same thing. You see, what's really interesting when you look at the history of dragons is that dragons have existed and they were known as dragons both before, during and after they were alive. All the way back through the myths and legends, there were dinosaurs. So it's got a lot colder recently in the last couple of hours, but we've had fun collecting fossils. Because it's not just sea dragons that you find round here, it's also lots of other different sea creatures and land plants. So down here we've got things like these smooth-shelled ammonites, the ridged ammonites as well. These can be found all over Charmouth and Lyme Regis. We've even got this adorable little one down here. Look at this. Beautiful little one down here perfect on both sides. So you get all sorts of shapes and sizes from all over. But it's not just the curly whirly ammonites, you also get things down here, like these seashells. And we know what they are, they are pecton shells or scallop shells. And we know that they are pecton shells or scallop shells because they're still alive today. They're living fossils, they haven't changed one bit. Okay, same for this as well. This is a piece of fossil wood, a bit of fossil tree. It is so well preserved, we even know what kind of tree it is. It is the Oricaria tree, or the monkey puzzle tree as we call it today. It's exactly the same as its living relatives, no change whatsoever. In other words, in 190 supposed million years, fossil trees have turned into normal trees. There's been no change whatsoever, they're exactly the same. So what can these fossils actually teach us? Well remember, this land plant, the Oricaria tree, grows on the land, yet it's buried right next to seashells. Ammonites that we know from their modern day relatives, the Nautilus, live in the deep, deep ocean. So land plants and sea creatures mixed together, buried together right next to each other. And also bearing in mind, these beds go all over the world. Remember Alexander von Humboldt? He called these Jurassic because they were the same as the ones in the Jura Mountains. And they're the same in the ones in the US, in Canada, in Australia. They're the same lias beds that go all around the world. This is a huge, huge deposit. And it is all got land creatures, land plants, and sea creatures, and sea plants all mixed together. Now what does that tell us? Now my academic field of study is in something called paleobiology. Now this is basically looking at dead things like these fossils and trying to work out how they lived. And I'm supposed to come here to somewhere like Charmouth or Lyme Regis and be able to build an ecosystem, work out an exact habitat, but you find it is completely impossible to do because you have got land plants and land creatures buried right next to sea creatures. It's not a habitat at all. It's all been mixed up and it's a complete mess. In fact, this isn't the most stark difference. There was a fantastic Scalediosaurus skeleton, a dinosaur that was found here a few years back. It was squashed, mixed up with other creatures and fossils dumped together with such violence that it's even squashed it so much that there's vomit, fossilized, coming out of its throat. It's remarkable. You see, when you have land creatures and land plants buried next to sea creatures, you have got yourself some fantastic evidence of an enormous flood. Come and see this, what we've just found down here. This is a clear example, if you've ever seen one. This whole bit here is all fossil wood. Again, Oricaria. You can see it all running through here. You see the top of it here. But look what we've got just down here. Can you see that? The curly-whirly ammonite, a deep sea creature 
buried next to a big chunk of fossil pine wood. Oracaria monkey puzzle tree. This is spectacular evidence for a flood. A huge land plant and a big little sea creature buried together. This is flood evidence. Do you like mystery detective programs? You know when they've found the body and they're trying to work out how long it's been dead for? They can tell it by how decayed the body is or how badly preserved it is. And it's pretty well the same with fossils. You see, when you dig up fossils, you know how long they've been lying around for before they've been fossilized. And in every single case that we find here at Lyme Regis, we know that it has been buried very, very quickly. The preservation is fantastic. But we can go one step further. You see, the old idea that fossilization takes millions of years or needs vast amounts of time is completely rubbish. If you have vast amounts of time to turn your creature or plant into a fossil, it will be destroyed long before you ever have chance to actually get it turned into a fossil. In other words, fossilization has got nothing to do with time, but everything to do with a process. And you need the right process. And it's not the case of have the right process, it happens quickly, have a wrong process, it takes millions of years. If you do not have the right process in place, your creature will be destroyed completely and totally. Time is your biggest enemy when it comes to creating a fossil. You need to have it all in the right place at the right time. You need your creature to be buried quickly. You need your creature to be buried deeply. And you need your creature to be buried without the presence of oxygen. If those things are not in place, you do not get a fossil. It has to be done with the right process. And that fits perfectly with our rocks and fossils that we find here, all along Lyme Regis and Charmouth, particularly when you consider how big the beds are. So what can we learn from Mary Anning? Well, she left a fantastic legacy, beautiful fossils that we are still enjoying today. But the most important thing was her faith. She was a Christian, she went to church, she believed that these rocks were the result of Noah's flood, just like many of the other leading scientists, including Sir Richard Owen. In fact, he founded the Natural History Museum so that people would be able to see the evidence of God's creation on display. He truly believed that dinosaurs were the monsters that God made and he wanted to put it on display so people could stand in awe of God's wonderful creation. He believed that they were buried as a result of Noah's flood. But don't be surprised because that's where the evidence leads. Remember these Jurassic beds? They go all over the world. They are huge. They're thick. They're full of mixed creatures, land plants, land dinosaurs, land animals, mixed up with seashells, sea creatures, fish. Whenever you get land plants and land creatures mixed up with sea creatures, you have got evidence of a flood. And this flood went all over the world because the Jurassic sediment goes all over the world. This was an enormous flood that sounds very much like the flood described in the Bible. But don't forget, the flood of the Bible was God's judgment on mankind. Mankind was desperately wicked, as the Bible says, and God judged it. Now he's promised never to judge the earth in flood again, but we know that he's going to judge it again, this time by fire. Real global warming. Do you have your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? It is the most important thing ever. If you've enjoyed what we've been doing today and you want to find out more about what Creation Research UK does around the country, go to www.creationresearchuk.com. If you want to buy the accompanying booklet to Charmouth and Lyme Regis so that you too can come here and find your own fossils, dig up your own sea dragons, go to www.therockscryout.co.uk. Get the book, watch the videos and find out more about the wonderful locations where you can go and explore. I'm Indiana Joe, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye, God bless, I will see you very soon. Happy hunting.